Well, Bill, just a privilege and honor to be able to be before you guys to open up God's holy and precious word. Um, our local church is eternally grateful for the investment of you guys and the mission of our church and making disciples in our community. Um, we set out on that, that mission two years ago, and we've seen God's grace move in so many different ways as we've seen um, people who do not know the Lord come to know him, those mature in Christ in particular ways through our local church. Um, and we're just getting started. And so um, we're praying for continued faithfulness and continued um, vitality and just being faithful to the gospel um, until the end. And so we're really grateful to be able to be here um, with you guys today. If you have a copy of God's word, turn with me to Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Again, that's Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 this morning. Give you a moment, but as I'm about to read these, these words into your hearing, here's what the word of the Lord says. And he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. Praise be to God for the reading of his word. I want to tag the text for our exchange this morning, proclaiming the gospel so more people know God, proclaiming the gospel so more people know God. As you've been setting out on this sermon series, you've been seeking to understand your purpose that's attached to the goals that are at hand. And one of these purposes we're going to see in this text is something that we can adamantly learn from Christ in a way that we should move forward and seeking to honor him for his glory by making disciples who make disciples. Because in our text, we'll learn from Jesus about what it means to proclaim the gospel so that more people can know him. In Christian circles today, we will quantify that term with being missional. We want to live on mission. We want to reach people. Maybe you've heard some of those phrases used before, but in our text, we're going to see that desire to share the good news work itself out in some tangible manners. But here's the reality. If there's not a structure or a framework in which you're, you're moving towards mission, you probably won't accomplish mission. But on top of that, if you don't understand your purpose, your mission will be fainting. Why, why would that be the case? Because if you don't remember that the sole aim in you seeking to reach your neighbors, reach those who are around you is for them to know and to love God, friends, you can get distracted. You can get so distracted because you'll look for the new strategy and your strategy's not working, but you will miss those who are in front of you whom God has placed before you. See, this text is going to be evident here for us. So I want us to see this, is that our desire to proclaim good news needs to be accompanied by our hearts that yearn to see those around us to intimately know God, intimately know him in the way hopefully that I hope for you, that you would know God in such a way that you've encountered the father through the son's love that was displayed for us on the cross of Christ and the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to the glorious news of the gospel and your need for that relationship with the savior. You want your neighbors, your friends, your family members, those in your community to know and to love God. Have you ever been, though, around someone who has some good news to share with you? You, you talk to them and you, you know they're ready to share that good news with you. But the entire time that they're aiming to communicate to you, they're talking past you. Or maybe they're just trying to get that weight off their shoulders. You, you've had that conversation before. I, I know you have. Where they're just trying to get that information out to you. And you're like, do you really, are you really trying to talk to me? Do, do you understand my personhood that I'm right here before you? I'm a person with a soul that desires to, to know and be known. See, we do this sometimes when it comes to, to mission. We say we want to take the good news of the gospel to the nations. We want to take it to our neighbors. But sometimes we want just to communicate that information. And we miss the hearts of people. Engaging them where they're at, who they are. And trusting God for his desire, his ability to transform and transcend. 
See, our purpose behind our proclamation serves as the foundation for our posture in mission. You talk about people having a good or bad posture. Sometimes we have bad postures and our heart is off. Our posture is probably going to be off. And so if our, our posture isn't for those around us to know our Lord, friends, you might drift. See, I've witnessed this before with some people, even that I know and love, that they've tried to engage someone, but they've talked past them. They just wanted to be able to say that they shared the gospel. Oh, I, I, I checked off the box. I, I did it this week. I shared the gospel, but they missed the person. See, what we learn from Jesus in this text is that to be missional is threefold. It means we engage people, friends, we befriend people, and then he transforms people. Let me repeat that to you one more time. It's that we engage people, we befriend people, and he transforms people. Because it's so easy for us to want to, to split those things up and maybe hone in on one of those over the other. And, and all of us probably have a tension within us that we might gravitate towards one over the other. And so I think that's where we need to be honest with ourselves. For some, they say, well, you know, I'm good at moving towards people. You know, I'm nice with, the, nice with them at the grocery store, or at the park or whatever. Maybe some you're good at befriending people, making friends. Then other is you got to watch God transform. You got to plead with God to transform them. You got to share the gospel and trust the spirit to work and doing this work within another person. So let us reflect on what it means for us to be these missional people together. That leads me to point number one this morning. Mission challenges you to move toward people. Mission challenges you to move toward people. At this time, Jesus' te- teaching ministry is growing in Galilee. He recently had healed the paralytic and everyone was wanting to be in his presence. Could you just imagine coming down Courthouse Road right now, a mob of people following a man because something big had happened and they just wanted to be in his presence. You probably will look at them and say, ain't it odd? That's weird. Y'all all probably be pointing outside the windows of the church right now and say, what is going on there? But a movement was transpiring and this group of people desire to learn more. They desire to hear more from Jesus. But, but this is the key observation I want us to understand is that Jesus taught those who were currently following him and he moved towards those who did not follow him. So as they are following him, walking alongside of him, he had his eyes set on other people. He wanted those other people to, to come to know him. And this causes us to pause and to reflect for a moment. As God's people, his church, we sometimes tend to believe that there is a false dichotomy between biblical community and mission. I mean, people swing either way on that conversation at times, but some Christians only spend time with Christians, and there's others that say, well, I only need to spend time with non-believers. Both within itself can be a bad extreme, but here's the reality. Christians should be tethered to community and be passionate about those who are far from God. Friends, you don't have to choose. You should live within the tension and be on mission because you will cherish community more when you spend time with people who don't know Jesus. Oh, oh, why is that the case? Well, let me tell you real quick. You've had it before. When you've been with some people who don't know the Lord and you're walking with them, you're having conversations with them, you're like, well, this just ain't the same. Well, when you go back to your community, you you sit with them, you, you, you relate with them, you have conversations with them, you're like, okay, this is what God has created us for. The same is true on the the opposite side of the spectrum. You will praise God for mission when you experience a community of people who are always on mission. Let me tease that out for you for a moment. The people that they might bring to you as you're hanging out in community are not seen as an obstacle or a hurdle, but an opportunity for God to work. Friends, sometimes if we are not living on mission in community together, we will become nearsighted sometimes and we will miss out on what God wants to do. We, we will we'll miss out on how he wants to work through his church because the church flourishes not in this tension, but in unison. We, we move forward together in such a healthy way when we buy into it collectively and hold each other accountable. Because friends, each one of you will, will drift in one direction or the other. This is why you need the church to hold you accountable and to move you forward together. So when we talk about making disciples, it happens both inside and outside the community of believers you will probably be in discipleship relationships with those inside of your community group and the spaces of the people that you're walking with in discipleship groups. But also, friends, you should have a desire to make disciples in the marketplace, the city center, at your job, at the gym, and at the park, wherever God takes you to. There's an opportunity before you to continue to make 
disciples. And that's what we see in this text that Jesus gives us a vision so that we can seek to understand what it looks like to actually pursue other people. And the cool thing about it is he shows us and he says, come and join me while I'm on mission because the community of believers join him on mission. He showed them how. Many times that's the reason why a lot of us struggle to engage in mission. We're nervous. We don't know what to do, how to do it. But God's given us his people, his church to walk alongside of, to, to encourage us along the way. But you have to look for the opportunities. You, you have to go before yourself and say, God, have you placed people in the spaces that I'm already in? Have you given me opportunities to, to reach other people while I'm living? So raise that question for yourself. Are there people that you're just missing right now that God has placed before you? Because on the other side of that, many of us have become isolated in missional living. We've relegated our families to the Lone Ranger mentality. Oh, we're just going to take our neighborhood for Christ all by ourselves. But we forget that God has given us a people to walk alongside of us for that conversation that you might have with someone that they might come from a different background. They might have different interests than you. You're like, I just don't even know how to relate to them. That's why God has given you his people to walk alongside of you so you can do life together, so you can bring people into those conversations with you. Friends, you're not called to do this alone. But Christ did this with a purpose. It was as he was going, as he was walking the streets. He was seeking to make disciples by engaging, friends, befriending, and transforming people's lives. But why did he do this? Because of the internal purpose of the Father to establish his kingdom. See, anytime we separate the mission of God from eternal purpose, of God making himself known to the nations, friends, you might be tempted to settle even in your own life for just making converts than disciples of Jesus. You might just be set, willing to settle, with just, oh, let me just get to them this information. As long as, as long as they say yes, I'm good. If they say no, I'll try again later, you know. But in this text, I think we see that Christ walks alongside of them in a different way. He proclaims who he is, but then calls him to actually to follow him. And you don't have to do this alone. See, going back at the text, see what he says here. He, he sets his eyes on Levi, and he went to him and said, follow me. I mean, could you just imagine just those two words being said by the God of the universe in this moment? And you're like, okay, I'm coming. I mean, could you imagine yourself having that ability to have that conversation with a neighbor and have that much force? Well, we don't, but we can still learn from Jesus here. Sometimes we look at Christ and what he did in this moment and say, well, that was really easy for him. But he still gives us a paradigm for us to understand that we still need to engage our neighbors well with the gospel. There's two important lessons we should learn from this in this moment is that he moved toward Levi and he still called him to faith. So you have to be intentional in making disciples. You're not just going to stumble into making disciples or sharing your faith with others and actually walking alongside of them. No, friends, active Christians make disciples. And active Christians are content with converts. They're content with saying, hey, as long as they show up, they declare faith in one moment, we're good. Active followers of Jesus are not content with just people just sitting in the status quo but they want to see them mature in Christ and grow in their love and joy of the Lord. See, that's why the purpose matters. This has to be rooted and founded in this desire for people to know and to love God. Because if we relegate it to something else, it will be dangerous for them because they actually might miss out on God. So take advantage of these opportunities that you've been placed in. Keep moving towards people because we are creatures of habit. You might be wondering, well, I don't have opportunities around me. Yes, you do. You have habits. You go to the grocery store about the same time every week. You see the same type of cashiers and tellers. You go to the same coffee shops around the same time with the same baristas. But the barista knows your name because they've written your name down 15 times, but you never got to know their name. You, you've seen the same people at the gym, but you walk into the gym, you start lifting weights. Like, I hope nobody talks to me. Got my headphones in. Don't, don't bother me. Try not to engage. Friends, the Lord has placed you in a space for a reason 
and giving you the opportunity to engage. But what will you do with it as you are going to the grocery store, to the gym, to the parks? Will you take advantage of this opportunity? Will you move toward people? Amen. So you have the decision to make. Will you see them as an obstacle or an opportunity for God to work? And this is why it's so perplexing for those who are following Jesus in this moment. Jesus starts moving toward Levi, and in their mind is like, why would you go and pursue someone like him? It just doesn't make sense. Maybe you've been with somebody before, and they start having that conversation with the people that you were hoping wouldn't talk to you, or the person sitting at the table next to you, like, I'm, just, I'm having my own family meal by myself. Don't bother me. Come on, y'all need to be real with yourselves. God knows it's there in y'all, right? I've been there too, so I'm with you. But we, this is where we need to check our hearts, though, because they're like, why would you pursue relationship with someone like him? Well, Levi, let me tell you about him for a moment. He was a disliked man. He was a tax collector. And back then, tax collectors were straight up hustlers. And some of y'all are like, they still hustlers. They still hustle me right now with my money. See, the government at this time utilized a farming system for tax collecting. And individuals would make bids to the government to become a tax collector. So what they would do is they would go to the government and say, okay, I will take the bids for you and go um, grab all the money that you need. But here's the, the catch. Anything over the tax from the government, they got to pocket themselves. They were not held accountable. They could do whatever that they wanted to do. So these tax collectors said, well, this gives me enough incentive. You know, I'm just trying to monopolize my opportunity. So they go down to Courthouse Road at the intersection of Melothian Turnpike, set up their tax booth, you know. Imagine me just sitting there waiting for you. said, oh, man, you drive this car, you know. You must be doing all right. Like, uh, $600. They would have to hand it over to them. Even though the tax from the government was only 250 that's a quick, quick dollar. Put it in their pockets. The pockets were deep from these individuals. I mean, they, they were the first hustlers here we see. So it makes sense why they didn't like them. In this moment, any time and place, they could do whatever they wanted. Hmm. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine what would be going through your mind if you saw that person on the street and you saw Jesus moving towards them, seeking to build a relationship with them? Jesus was not talking to the executive officer or the facilities manager, not a white-collar worker, in their minds, or a blue-collar worker in their minds, whatever's in your head, but he engaged the person that no one wanted him to talk to. And he moved towards them. He didn't look down. He engaged the person that everybody else was naturally disgusted with. See, Luke chapter 5, verse 28 says that Levi left everything, and he rose and followed him. Two words follow me, Levi turned towards Christ and started following him. But that's because Christ pursued him. See, friends, I don't know about you, but you might be missing some Levi's in your life that those people who are right around you, that others don't want to talk to, that you've previously haven't wanted to engage, but God has brought them right before you. What are you going to do with this opportunity? What if God desires for them to know him intimately, deeply, and he's called you to share the gospel to build relationship with them so that they can walk with our Lord. See, for us to reach a Levi, it will require you to remember the heartbeat of God, God's desire in us being called to this great commission to make disciples. That's not something that sits within you of just whenever you want to, but it's like, no, God's called me to himself through the gospel, and he desires for other people to know him as well. See, God yearns for his imagers to know him. And the cross of Christ is a clear articulation of this reality. Why is that the case? Because it shows the extent that God is willing to go for people like you and I, for people that have rebelled against him, sinned against him, who have a sin nature. He showed us his love and his care and that he wants us to know him. And the cross shows us that reality. So if Jesus moves towards people, we should move towards them too. And he did that by coming to earth and then ultimately dying and raising from the grave. That leads me to point number two this morning. See, mission drives you to befriend people who do not know Jesus. Mission drives you to 
befriend people who do not know Jesus. She short, shortly after meeting Jesus and deciding to follow him, Levi went back to the crib. I'm going to tell this in KJ's rendition of the story for a moment, if y'all would allow me to do so. So as custom, they would celebrate the salvations of individuals. That is true. But Levi goes out and throws this massive party. It's the type of party that your neighbors throw in the backyard that you're like, man, can they just tune it down right now? Massive party. I mean, I'm just imagining the great spread of food. For me, this is my, my love here, you know. So I'm looking for, look, nice fried chicken, macaroni and cheese, greens, rolls, etc. They're eating the food for the glory of God. They're, they're feasting. They're throwing down. This is, this is a good cookout, right? So it's the party's happening, right? But Jesus comes to this moment, and he's there with them, and the Pharisees roll up. And they're like, why are you hanging out with them? Let me note this. If you're a tax collector and you're despised by other people, you probably had other friends that people didn't like either. So in that moment, they come to him, they see him there, and that he's spending time with them. But they, they weren't okay with that. If you note in the text, it gives two identifying clauses there to, to help us understand on phrases to help them understand who the tax collectors are. He says, they're tax collectors and sinners. Couldn't just settle for sinners, like doubling down. Like, let me un- help you understand how bad they were in our eyes. So Christ knew this, but he still spends time with them, even though they were frustrated with them. See, the, the Pharisees were religious zealots who were legalistic and law bound. And they believed it was unlawful for Jesus to be with uncleansed people. And they were like, hey, brother, you're about to explain yourself for the reason why you are here. But inside of us, we have that same temptation. Have you looked at another follower of Jesus for trying to maybe invest in somebody's life? You're like, why are you hanging out with them? Maybe it's you were at the store. And you're like, oh, that doesn't make sense why they're associated. Or you look outside in your neighbor's house and they have certain people coming over. You're like, this doesn't make sense. Why are you bringing them into our neighborhood? Those types of thoughts might come through your mind. So this type of pharisaical mindset could be within us because we will even judge fellow believers when they seek to reach the loss. Let alone we might judge some within the church because they might resemble the loss a little bit too much. But Jesus befriends them and engages them in this moment. Friends, sanctification is a process. It takes time. But God saw this as an opportunity knowing what he could do in Levi, but also what he could do in his friends group with his co-workers. So he invested his time there. See, sometimes we've been so far removed from not knowing Christ that we don't even know how to engage people who are far from Christ. Let me me tease that out for a moment. So you've walked through maturation to a certain level where you've grown so much and by God's grace, you've grown. Praise God for the growth in your life. But you act like sometimes you don't really remember how it used to be. It's not until that moment where that friend from 25 years ago says to you, hey, you remember back in the day when you were doing, ah, man, don't talk about that anymore. Because it reminds you who you used to be. And there's something about that force because we struggle to engage those who do not know the Lord at times because sometimes we forget where we come from, how his grace met us, how his grace transformed our lives. And the Pharisees are like, how could you be with such a people like this? Friends, don't lo- lose sight of how God has worked in your life, of your own sinfulness, your own brokenness, honestly, your own personal need right now for God to work in your life. This text, he wasn't dealing with people that were seekers in this moment. Maybe those who might walk through the church doors and they want to learn more. But Jesus engaged those who seemed too far for others. See, friends, Jesus befriended these sinners and he wasn't ashamed. Do you think about that for yourself? Do you feel like you'd be ashamed if you actually engaged certain people in the grocery store, in the marketplace, at your job? 
Maybe because they, they're ostracized or they don't have the life that everybody else wants. Maybe it's the person that you might see on the side of the road. Maybe at the park. See, Jesus is a friend of sinners. And friends, you should remember that for yourself. And you should praise God for that, that he is a friend of sinners. Because he met you where you were at. He, he walked alongside of you when times were trough, troubling and tough. He, he, he comes alongside of you in such a way that he washes you in his grace. See, Jesus befriending sinners did not mean he lost his standard of righteousness, but that he wanted to walk alongside of them. I mean, if you would just think about it with me for a moment. Have you ever been in a cafeteria before? All of you have probably. And you've seen that child sitting by themselves. Maybe that was you in school. You're probably one or two people. You probably engaged them or you stayed away. Maybe you've been that person yourself. But in this text, what Christ is helping us understand is that he moved towards the person that someone did not want to talk to. And he met them there. And that's good news. Because there's sometimes that you're not too lovely. There's sometimes that you're not too caring in your mind. There's sometimes when you don't feel lovable. But God still meets you there. There's times when you feel like people, maybe Christian friends, will, will judge you for something that you're walking through and no one will want to walk alongside of you. But Jesus is the friend of sinners. He, he comes there. He, he walks alongside of you, friends. That should give you hope. And that should challenge us. Because God's called you in the same way to go out and to befriend and to care well for those who are around us. So not only did he call us to move toward them, but he calls us to befriend them. So we should spend time with those who don't know Jesus. But we don't spend time with them without a purpose. Our purpose is for them to know God and enjoy him forever. So this might push you outside of your comfort zone. This might mean that you might need to actually make friendships with people. And that can be hard at times. I mean, it's really interesting how awkward grown adults are at times with making friends. Like you tell kids all the time, like, hey, y'all should go make friends, so-and-so. Adults are just as awkward. And y'all know, too, that's why you're laughing. You're like, yeah, like, I, it's really hard having a conversation. Like, you talk to someone that you don't know or you don't have something, like, that you relate to them with in your mind. So you're like, okay, what do I say? Hey, how are you doing today? Man, whew, you know? But it's real. It's true. We need to seek to build friendships with people. And friendships take time to develop trust and the ability to even to speak into someone's life. It takes effort and investment of time, care, and intentionality. It takes the opportunity of opening up and getting hurt. But a greater opportunity for God's grace to be put on display. See, many of us don't pursue relationships because it will be an issue in our own life. It will complicate it a little bit. You feel like you're self-sufficient. You have what you need. But God's still calling us to move towards people. Will you trust him to build friendships, to use them for his glory? Will you trust that God will work in you as you befriend other sinners? And this is how God can work in us. It's going to be a smooth process at times. It's going to be a hard process at times. But this is how God's called us to, to engage people. He spent time with them. He dwelt with them. Start in your neighborhood. Consider your workplace. People want these relationships. And God might just use you to draw someone to himself as you share this good news, as you embody this good news, and you live in this way. Because when you reach out to them, it should be from a desire for those who are sick to be healed. To, to encounter the great physician. Third this morning is that mission cares about those who are sick, encountering the physician. In verse 30, Mark describes the grumbling of the Pharisees. Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? I mean, it's the million dollar question that they had been wondering about. I mean, how could someone of this stature in the community the righteous one, stooped down so low to be among sinners like them. 
I mean, they already believed that the, these sinners were as unrighteous as it could get. So why would the righteous man go with them? Maybe that's similar to you. Maybe you think about your own life and you're like, I only want to be around people that are moving exactly in the same direction as me. Maybe a few steps ahead of me, maybe one step or two behind me, but by all means, like they have to by minimum be a Christian. And yes, I've already made the case that you need biblical community. But also you can't miss out on moving towards those who are in front of you. So this is why this is so confusing for them because for Jesus in this moment, he's captivating us by a vision of hard work. Pressing in in this way isn't easy. It takes months, it takes years. It's not just a conversation in a moment, but it's opening yourself to people to walk alongside of them. It's you thinking about Friday night and your schedule and so-and-so really wants to watch the game with you, but you're like, my, my couch is really comfortable right now. I've had a long day at work. But you know your neighbor is just a, a big fan of that sports team, and they would love just to watch it, the game with someone. But you invite them in. Maybe it's at your dinner table. You just want quick dinners, but you know that if you take time to invite someone over, it might take a while. The kids might go down a little bit later. It might throw off your family schedule. But you're seeking to befriend them with the purpose, friends. Because those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. The world's sick. We've been impacted by sin and we need someone to be the redeemer. And then the Pharisees understood this illustration. Like logically, it makes sense. A sick person needs to go to the doctor. But I don't know about you. I know myself. Sometimes I'm a little lackadaisical about getting to the doctor. I think that I can get over whatever on my own. I can keep stalling as long as I can before I acknowledge my need. But in this moment, what Christ is saying is like, no, no, no. I've got the prescription for, for what they need. For the Pharisees, the second observation maybe would be is that they didn't realize they were sick too. Or they believed that they outgrew their sickness. So the only reason that we'll keep moving towards people is if we remember our status and our need for the physician. Have you settled in such a way in your own heart that you believe that you've outgrown the need for the great physician? Have you been trying to take over your life and put into your own hands and trying to work yourself out of whatever situation that you might be in to, to aid in your ailment? Maybe you're someone who hasn't experienced the work of the great physician, the transforming power of the gospel, how Jesus can change you from the inside out, how he can change everything about your life. Maybe you're someone who has experienced that transformation, but you've forgotten how bad it is when you acknowledge your sickness and you know that you need him to work. Some of us have become so self-sufficient that we don't need to keep looking towards them. We feel like our diagnosis is just surface level, but it's deep. The more you go through the files of seeing what's going on in your life, the deeper you get into the brokenness and even in your own heart and your need for someone to redeem. But there's others, though, who I know who can attest with me to the physician's ethical standards and success rates. You've walked through some things in your life. You've been through some valleys. And every time you walk through some troubling situations, whether it's with your sin or someone else's sin, God's met you there. Maybe it's been at, at your workplace and you've had a hard boss. And you've been trying to navigate that season and you've been looking for strength, but you run to one who can give you the strength. Maybe it's with your family. You've been struggling for patience and a, and a way to care well for your children or for your spouse, but but God gives you what you need. Friends, if you've encountered the great physician, you're a living testimony of his work and you can attest to his ethical standards. And so when you look at your neighbors and, and they ask you about the goodness of the Lord, you can look to them and say, I've seen God work. I've seen him move. I know where I used to be and I know where I'm going. God has done a redemptive work in my life. So do you want to see the great physician as well? But some of us, we've, easily have forgotten. 
We want to put the past away. And you're forgiven. That grace is there. But there's something about remembering what the Lord has brought you from that gives you vision for the person in front of you, for what he can bring them through. See, sometimes it's we forget five years ago where we were at. And so when we see someone right in front of us, we're like, I just don't get why you don't see it this way. Friends, it's a process. But we're still called to engage and appoint them to the physician. So we want people to know the great physician. And our aim in life is to help those around us to know him. So what does that look like for your life? Who are you having conversations with? Who are you sharing this good news of the gospel with? Because what are his next words? I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So God has maybe brought you through some things in your life, showed you your sin, your need for him. He can do the same for others. See, the righteous do not see a need for a savior, but the unrighteous are willing to look to God for redemption. So you want to bring this good news to people. Share with them the stories about how God has worked in your life. See, following Jesus is about denying the self-righteousness that can inhabit us at times. And it means that we trust Jesus for grace and transformation. And maybe that's a part of your story right now, why you don't want to apply grace to others, is because you've become content, settled in your own self-righteousness when you should be remembering it's only by the grace of God that you don't act the way you used to act. You're not doing the things you used to do last week. You're just a tad bit more patient since yesterday. That's all God's grace. So what do we learn here from Jesus? He moved towards sinners. Jesus befriended sinners. Jesus cares for sinners by revealing to them the great physician. And you might wonder, how does he reveal this to them? Well, there was a time in history when God himself came to earth and he put on flesh. He came and he dwelled among us and he, he suffered in ways that we would suffer. He was suffering in some ways that we could never even imagine suffering in. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was beaten. He was battered. And he all did it for a purpose so that he could bring about this redemption to, to save those who were in need of a physician. Even though we were sick, even though we didn't want to look to him, he, he came with a purpose in mind. And that purpose was so that you could know the Father and his love so others could experience the ramifications of God's redemption. Not your self-prescribed help. That's where we run to first. But God, his grace and his mercy that is displayed for us ultimately on the cross of Christ. So he showed it to us. He proved it to us. And that there's going to be a day when we get to experience the fullness of this restoration, this process of redemption that God can only bring forth. So we should even desire that our neighbors, our friends around us would be able to participate with us in this redemption. So we engage them for a purpose. We move towards them for a reason. And we share the gospel, trusting that God's going to transform them in hope, trusting God's promises. So friends, this morning, I want to encourage you to engage like Jesus, befriend like Jesus, and to advocate for transformation like Jesus. This is what it's going to look like for you to embody a missional life. You got to understand your purpose if you want to work out his framework, if you want to see the, the results that you're hoping for. But you have to trust God and his spirit along the way. There's one part of the story that I left out intentionally to the end. Because you never know what God is going to do in someone's life. You, you, you never know. You never know. But this narrative reminds us of God's ability to save any sinner. He gives us a paradigm of how to reach people. But here's the part I left out. The tax collector by the name of Levi is later known as Matthew. The same Matthew who served as an apostle, wrote the gospel of Matthew, helped take the gospel to the nations. You don't know what God can do in someone's life. 
You don't know the plans that God has for someone, but he's called you to go. As you're going, share this glorious news. He's called you to engage people. The world was forever changed by Levi. You reap the benefits of this engagement that Jesus had with Levi, who's now Matthew. Friends, if that doesn't give you hope, either for yourself or for those that you see, I don't know what will. Because it means that God can do a work in people who are far from him, rebelling against him, and he can do magnificent things in their lives, all for his glory. So this morning, live for the sake of the gospel, embrace the mission of Jesus, and proclaim the gospel so that more people will know him. Remember your purpose, friends. Pray with me. Father, we, we come before you I'm first understanding our own personal need for you to be the physician in our lives. Lord, we know how easy it is for us to, to gravitate towards other self-helps or quick fixes. But Lord, I pray that our, our hearts would long for you to be the redeemer. But as we've experienced this personal redemption, my prayer is that that would move us to desire the same for our neighbors and our friends. Lord, help us to catch a vision for our lives of helping others to know and love you. Because Father, we desire to see a movement take place but that means we have to walk alongside those who are around us. We actually have to engage them in relationship. And Father, we get to sit back and watch you work. So in faith and obedience, I pray that we would trust you in this process of, of sharing our faith, building relationships, but that we would trust your promises that you are building a people a people that will indwell the, the new heavens and the new earth with you. And that we long for the day where your restoration will be evident. But until then, we want to take this good news of your love and your care for us to the nations. But Father, help us to start in our neighborhood, our communities our workplaces, our home. So we ask for your help, Holy Spirit. Father, we pray all these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. Week in and week out here at Village, there's a response to the proclamation of God's word through the ordinance of communion. And communion is special because it reminds us of what Christ has done for us that his body was broken for us, his blood was poured out for us. And so when we take and eat, we do so in remembrance of Jesus and what he has done. But today, I want to challenge you to think about your need for the great physician and how he went to the cross for you to redeem your life. And maybe there's some areas that you haven't brought before him, that you've been trying your own home remedies for a long time you haven't fixed it yourself. Here's a moment, opportunity for you to come before him and to ask the Father to work in you in this, to repent of any sin in your own life and to trust him. But also there's the opportunity for those who don't know Christ to consider what it looks like to place your faith in Christ. And I would encourage you to have a conversation with someone. There'll probably be people out in the foyer who would love to talk to you about what it looks like to follow Jesus. And then I have one last exhortation for those who are followers of Jesus. I want to encourage you to consider those who are around you that you've been avoiding, that you haven't sought to build relationships with. And even maybe as I've been talking, those people have come to mind. And after you partake, I want to encourage you to pray for them, that God would use you to reach them. So when you're ready, take, eat, Rejoice in what the Lord has done for us through the cross of Christ. But friends, live out your purpose 
Help other people to know and to love God.